blessings to you all. Today we've uh, come together on the occasion of Wisaka Puja, where we celebrate and recollect the birth, the enlightenment and the Parinibbana of the Buddha. This will often bring up feelings of gratitude and uh, appreciation for what the Buddha did for the world, what he achieved, uh, both through his own practice and also through his teachings. Uh, he's given us the chance to practice this, this way that will through his own efforts, he's proven already this way that will lead out of suffering um, and not just temporarily relief from stress and some of the sort of short term sufferings of life, but actually leads us out of samsara, the round, endless round of birth and death, uh, birth, old age, sickness and death. So it's also a day we can reflect on our own good fortune that we've come in contact with the Buddhist teachings. Um, it's probably due to having met a Buddha in a past life that in this life we've come to have faith in the Buddha and his teachings. Um, everything has its cause and Having met a Buddha in a past life, even if we can't remember, will have been an occasion that planted a seed in our heart, in our mind, um, that is continually growing, um, coming to fruition. The Buddha himself, what made him a Buddha? Well, practicing over many, many lifetimes as what we call a Bodhisattva. Uh, a great being, one who has set their mind on enlightenment for the good of themselves and for the good of others. Um, there's two kinds of bodhisattvas. There's the niyata bodhisattva and the aniyata bodhisattva. You know, the, the bodhisattva who is confirmed by a Buddha, a previous Buddha, uh, in their aspiration to become a Buddha and that, in that previous lifetime, the, the Buddha that they've met has recognized their qualities and their aspiration and seen that their mind is so firmly set on that, that there'll be no wavering, no change. And they, they become a confirmed Bodhisattva, destined to become a Buddha at some point in the future. Um, there are the unconfirmed Bodhisattvas who may possibly give up that aspiration and practice <coughs> to become an arahant. Uh, so there's two kinds of bodhisattvas. But our, our Buddha, Siddhartha, was one who had been confirmed in a previous life as uh, Sumedha, the hermit, by Dipankara Buddha. And that um, set off a journey of many, many lifetimes practicing cultivating the parameters, not just the ordinary level of the parameters, but what we call the, the three levels, complete levels, complete sacrifice for the development of enlightened knowledge um, that makes a Buddha. So, you know, in some lifetimes ready to even sacrifice his life for the pursuit of the practice, letting go of attachment to ego, letting go of delusion, for the practice of compassion to help others. As we know, there's the famous stories such as when he encountered a mother lion who was starving and her uh, cubs were starving and out of compassion throwing himself off a cliff so that they could have food and rather than the mother lion eating her cubs, uh, the Buddha prevented that bad karma from taking place and sacrificed his own life. And over many, many lifetimes, that kind of sacrifice for the development of the path, sila, samadhi, panya, um, just reinforced 
the ten paramis that the Buddha ultimately perfected, that made him a Buddha, you could say. So on the night, or on the day of his birth as a Bodhisattva, it's the same day, the full moon in May, Vaisak or Visakha. The story says that the Buddha, having been born to his mother, uh, Mahamaya, he immediately was perfectly mindful. He was perfectly mindful while he was in the womb, perfectly mindful from his previous life due to the strength of that practice over so many lifetimes. And perfectly mindful at birth that he could take seven steps outwards from his mother and then he turned uh, he surveyed the world four directions and calmly coolly mindfully declared that he is the greatest the leader of the world and that this would be his last birth there'll be no more no more birth no more suffering for him that was his declaration um, it may be hard to believe, but when you look at the previous thousands and thousands of lifetimes, perhaps it's possible that the consciousness of a Bodhisattva can be that mindful and determined that even at birth the mindfulness is maintained. So just the birth alone of the Bodhisattva was an amazing uh, experience. Um, and course that led on to his life which although he was a human being with a body and a mind just like us you know, he did display extraordinary spiritual qualities due to this past karma that he'd, he'd been developing over many many lifetimes so that when he was born there was this uh, the custom in India his father was the leader his, the custom was to get sages and astrologers to come and uh, pronounce what kind of future lay in ahead for this the son you know the king Sudodana uh, was so proud and happy to have his new son he wanted to find out what what's going to happen and uh, traditionally they say you know, all of them raised two fingers when asked to predict the son and his future and they said uh, he's either going to become a world-conquering emperor, a righteous emperor, a just one, but world-conquering, you know, unstoppable, or a religious leader, a fully enlightened religious leader. But there's just the one who came in at the end who uh, raised the one finger and said, no, for sure he'll become a religious leader, a great enlightened teacher of the world, um, which was a great prediction and and we believe produce ripples of joy <coughs> in the assembled gathering but also because of uh, the father's attachment wanting his son to become the next leader and you know th thinking in more worldly ways uh, produced a sense of is like a warning or a danger oh, my son is is, is going to leave the palace leave this life that I am preparing for him and go off into the world to teach and to become a religious leader which is not what a typical father wants they want their son to become successful wealthy famous powerful so that led on to the the father um, spending and investing a lot of time and energy to protect um, the young prince Siddhartha from suffering through his life as he grew up. The word Siddhartha, the name they gave him, means one who is successful in all that he wishes for. Um, and so they, they knew from day one that this baby was something special, it had a radiance and aura around him, it had many special qualities that started to be displayed as he grew up, in the compassion, the athleticism, the intelligence, the understanding of life. And even his father understood that what is the cause that leads people onto the spiritual path? Well, it's a recognition of the suffering of the world. You know, when you see suffering, often that can be the trigger for wanting to find a way out 
a solution to suffering. So even though his father wasn't enlightened, he had a, already had a sense of what enlightenment, what, what causes it. And because of his strong attachment and desire for his son to pursue the worldly path, then of course that led to lots of attempts to stop his son from seeing or experiencing any kind of suffering. So Prince Siddhartha was brought up in the world, you know, in great comfort. He was spoiled, he was protected through the love of his father, his parents. Uh, unfortunately, his mother died seven days after he uh, he was born, but he had a um, stepmother, Mahapachapati, and they protected him from uh, all the normal kinds of problems and sufferings of life, gave him the best accommodation. He had his three palaces, one for the winter, one for the summer, and one for the rainy season. He had the best food, best entertainment, best education, best clothes, everything was best, best, best to try and, and get him used to that and attached to the world, to the comfort, the pleasure of the world. Um, but they couldn't knock out the seed of enlightenment, that enlightened knowledge we call Bodhi, as in Bodhivana, the monastery, monastery's name. You know, enlightened knowledge, it's a seed that had been planted a long time before in the mind of the Bodhisattva. And it can't be uh, eradicated or put out just like that. So it kept re-emerging re in the midst of all the comfort, the success, the pleasures of life. <coughs> the Buddha to be, the Bodhisattva, kept returning to his contemplations and seeing that the world is a place full of suffering, just as today we can see, you know, there's disease, there's war, there's conflict, there's the suffering of old age, sickness and death. And so through his young life, he kept encountering these and kept reflecting on, on the basic truths of life until, as we know, he finally reached a point where uh, he was ready to leave the lay life, the home life, and go off wandering in the forest. You know, the final trigger was having a son with his wife, um, realizing that even though it's a great thing to have a son, you know, to have an heir to the throne, to have an heir to your, who you feel you are, and to continue the family line, and so on, there was that sense that once you have a child, then you're even more entrapped or, or pulled to the world and that's why he gave his son the name Rahula which means a snare or a trap or something that pulls you pulls you back um, so that was the great renunciation leaving wife and child leaving his comfortable life to pursue something that was greater not only for himself but for all beings because he's a bodhisattva and the Buddha was contemplating, or the Bodhisattva was contemplating, you know, just as there is old age sickness and death for human beings, there must be something that is beyond old age sickness and death. Just as there's light and dark, uh, good and bad, there's suffering, there must be the end of suffering. This is the way he was sort of thinking that led him out of the, the palace, the comfortable life, into the forest. So the Bodhisattvas, many, many lifetimes were coming to fruition at that point when he was 29 years old, where he left the family life to go out into the forest, into poverty. You know, it's another sign of his renunciation. He's just able to leave all that comfort, pleasure, power, influence, everything behind and go and live the simple life of a monk in the forest, which meant you know, walking barefoot, dependent on arms, with no possessions, no property, no accommodation, no real security in the world. That in itself is a great example, not just for monks and nuns everywhere, but for lay people as well, a reminder that there is a higher happiness and that's what the Buddha was pursuing. And he went on to practice where he straight away sought out the best meditation teachers of the day, but didn't stay with them for very long because he was 
so skilled in meditation, in training his mind, in the, the discipline, the precepts, and the discipline needed to support meditation practice, and then the practice of developing states of calm, states of samadhi, firmness of mind, one-pointedness of mind. Um, we call the jhanas, so the rupa jhanas, form jhanas, arupa jhanas, formless jhanas, the, the most subtle states of concentration that the teachers could teach him. He mastered them all very quickly and he was even better, more capable than the teachers he lived with, which only confirmed to him that you know, what they taught was not yet the way because he intuitively could see there's still the causes, the seeds, the, the causes, underlying causes for suffering in his mind. There's still attachment there, even when you enter a deep state of samadhi. Even though it's blissful and has a very powerful cleansing effect on the mind, he could see that deep down there's deep-rooted craving and attachment in his mind that's still there and that's not purified yet by samadhi alone. So he also went on to study and practice the uh, strict asceticism that was f fashionable at the time in India and again pushed himself with the ascetic practices, fasting, holding his breath, um, staying in one posture for hours and hours, days and days and so on really to the point where he was almost dead, almost unconscious with the amount of effort he put in. Um, so again, better than anyone else in his day, um, but still didn't come to realization and could still see this is not the way. So on the night of his enlightenment, you know, the second thing we're celebrating today after the birth of the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva comes to the the area we now know as the Bodhi tree on the banks of the Naranjala River. And he decided to go it alone in the sense he practiced with all the foremost teachers and taken on the, all the methods available at that time. And there were many different teachers, different religions, you could say, at that time. And he investigated them all, so he wasn't just dismissing them out right uh, out of just theorizing or philosophy, he actually had practiced and understood their limitations. <clears throat> so then he had to go it alone and summon up all that accumulated barami from all these past lifetimes to sit under the, the Bodhi tree on the night of his enlightenment. And it's interesting, uh, you know, as we discuss and think about the enlightenment of the Buddha, he the night of his enlightenment, they divided the night into three parts. And in the first part of the night, he developed this insight into the, the recollection of past lives. And he could recollect innumerable past lives. The clarity of his samadhi, the stillness of mind, meant that he could, without doubt, follow the train of consciousness back into previous lives. Sure that he's not deluding himself, he knows that He's been born and died many, many times, innumerable times in different life situations and understanding already that you know, there's nothing you can hold on to and keep with you as a self because you keep being born and dying over life after life, whatever wealth, fame, fortune, beauty, happiness that you gather doesn't stay because you keep dying. Uh, you know, so you got the big picture as a, as a forerunner towards his final enlightened knowledge. And in the second part of the night, again with great effort, sitting, meditating, contemplating, he gained knowledge into the workings of karma, how beings arise and pass away, are born and die according to their karma, good and bad, that they've made through their life, and how karma keeps bringing up, keeps ripening from life to life, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, depending on causes and conditions. But he's started to gain that insight into how karma is at work. And there's no one in charge in the sense there's no God or gods or supreme being working karma that you can say is punishing people for their wrongs, 
um, rewarding them for the good things they do. You know, it's, it's a, a law of nature that is just is, just the way things work. Uh, actions to, based in wholesome intention, wholesome volition lead to certain kinds of results, uh, success, happiness. Actions rooted in unwholesome intentions lead to suffering. And that's just the way it is and it affects all of us and it's there whether we realize it or not. So this led on to his final realization of what we call the asawa kaya yana, the ending of the asawas, the, all the, the craving, the uh, ignorance, the craving, the delusions, and attachments that are the cause of suffering, the finally abandoning them. All the mental states rooted in greed, anger, delusion, he finally managed to abandon them and understood very clearly that what is the cause of suffering for human beings? Well, it's a, it's a process, a causal process. There are causes and conditions that lead to the arising of the experience of suffering and, and, and cause us to be born and then die and then born and then die over many, many lifetimes. These, the suffering we experience as human beings is, has its causes and the end of suffering also has its causes. Having understood a recollection of past lives and then understood the workings of karma, he could see that that's what the universe is governed by, you could say. It's a place of um, where causes and conditions are constantly influencing us people, and we arise according to causes and conditions, we pass away according to causes and conditions. Suffering as an experience arises due to causes, passes away, um, and that deep wisdom, deep insight the Buddha had allowed him to understand fully what is the cause of suffering for a human being. Well, it's ignorance, uh, giving rise to craving, attachment, becoming and birth. And this insight that he had, this profound insight he had on the night of his enlightenment broke that chain, uh, we call it dependent origination, um, the chain of that was broken. So he had this enlightenment experience based on this, this understanding of not self, you could say that, that uh, we are governed by, we are, we're, you might say human beings are governed by a process of causes and conditions. Good causes lead to good, ripening good good results, good outcomes, pleasure, happiness, bad causes, bad outcomes, and so on. But there's no person in that. This causes and conditions implies there's no owner, there's no ultimate control, whether it's a oneself or the gods or whatever, it's just the way things are. He had complete understanding of that. And then the complete understanding of what causes lead to the very insight he was having um, that need to be developed. So they say when that happened, his enlightenment experience, you know, it's just like the sun coming up in the morning. You know, the, the wisdom that arose in his mind on that night, his enlightenment, was like as bright as the sun you know, for a comparison. In fact, we could say it was brighter. So the Buddha pointed out there's no bright light. There's no, nothing as radiant as the, the mind, the enlightened mind that clearly sees through all delusions, all ignorance, understanding how suffering arises and what we must do to end it. So like the sun arising in the morning, dispelling the darkness of night, but bigger than our sun, you know, the, the light of wisdom that arose in the mind of the Buddha, that it, it filled and penetrated the 10,000 world systems. There's no corner of this universe or any other universe that wasn't penetrated by the light of wisdom of the enlightened mind of a, of a fully enlightened Buddha. So brighter than the brightest sun. Um, and they say the 10,000 world systems quaked. So it's like a spiritual earthquake, uh, but not just a sort of a passing shudder, you know, that earthquake was in itself a causal condition for many other good things to happen. As, you know, <coughs> the uh, 
all the deities, the devas, the brahmas rejoiced, were happy, um, and it led on to so many other things which have gradually come up to where we are today. And we still have these Buddhist teachings. The wisdom of the Buddha is still here, you know, present in the the texts we have now, the Tripitaka texts, in the Dhamma, in the Vinaya that we practice, and the teachings we practice. You know, they're, they're still left in the world today. So a momentous occasion, Vesak, the enlightenment of the Buddha, or the birth of the Bodhisattva, the enlightenment of the Buddha, and then having been enlightened, re re gaining that knowledge, off he went to teach out of compassion for the rest of his life, 45 years, still living very simply as a monk, walking barefoot around India, and going back to those f seven steps he took as a, a bodhisattva, as the baby, taking these seven steps, people always ask, what do they symbolize? Well, they symbolize the seven factors of enlightenment. What is it that brings the mind to its experience of awakening or enlightenment, the end of suffering? Whereas well, this, these seven factors have to be developed, and this is what the Buddha pointed to over and over again as he taught. We have to practice what he taught. The, the Buddhist path is not simply to be believed. Um, it's not just a theory, a nice theory for the books. It's not just an ancient tradition that we can believe in and appreciate or not. It's a practice, a living practice that's relevant in this, in this day and age for us here and now on this very night. We can also practice developing these seven factors of enlightenment. And they start with sati. It's the, what the Buddha encouraged us to develop over and over again. You're the heart of our practice, the practice that's never wrong, the development of mindfulness, awareness, recollection in the present moment, or knowing in the present moment. And this is why our, all our meditation teachers who have followed the Buddhist path and, and experienced the same awakened knowledge as the Buddha, such as Ajahn Chah, their teachings are full of this encouragement to keep coming back to the present moment and develop sati, mindfulness, every day. Because as soon as we lose our mindfulness, we're back into the world of creating, becoming, craving, attachment, becoming, birth. Um, we're going away from the awakened knowledge that, that made a Buddha a Buddha and makes an Arahant an Arahant. So on a night that we practice you know, dedicating our efforts to the Buddha and uh, in gratitude, appreciation of, of the Buddha's teachings and then our own aspiration to improve ourselves and find peace, happiness, this is what we can develop. S moments and moments of sati, mindfulness, through sitting meditation, walking meditation, whatever activity we're involved with, the Buddha encourages us to always to come back to developing mindfulness, Sampajanya, clear comprehension um, in all postures, <clears throat> all activities. Why? Well, because it becomes the vehicle, the supporting vehicle for the arising of wisdom, <clears throat> which is what makes a Buddha a Buddha. How does a Buddha become a Buddha? He becomes Buddha because he develops the wisdom that sees and knows the way things are, sees and knows the impermanent nature of all these causes and conditions that he understood to see them as dukkha, suffering because they're constantly changing and degenerating, and to see that they're not self, they're not ultimately under our or anybody else's control. Sati is what supports the arising of wisdom through investigation of the Dhamma, what we call Dhamma Vichaya, the seven, second factor of enlightenment. And you know, if you're ever at a loss, what shall I do in my practice? We'll bring up mindfulness and investigate the Dhamma. <clears throat> And in the beginning, often investigation of the Dhamma just means knowing whether you're developing the path <clears throat> that the Buddha taught or not. Are you on the path or not? Are you developing your sila, maintaining your sila? Are you developing samadhi and mindfulness and states of calm? Are you developing wisdom, investigating the truth or not? In the beginning, it's just that investigation, examining what you're doing at any one moment, knowing the quality of your mind. Is it wholesome? Is it not? Are you awake, alert, mindful or not? To keep developing that skill 
which is something we can do as human beings. You know, we can learn, we can develop knowledge, understanding and awareness based on this practice. So sati and dhamma which are mindfulness and investigating the dhamma are two founding factors of the, the, the awakening factors, the factors of enlightenment that the, the Buddha developed and encouraged us to develop. With the practice of mindfulness and investigating the Dhamma, it leads up to leads to the development of wisdom. Uh, sorry, wiriya, uh, persistent effort, um, persistent in the sense that continuous effort to bring up mindfulness, develop the practice, contemplate the, the Dhamma, investigate the Dhamma. It takes effort because our habit as human beings, as we know, is always to drop away from the Dhamma to the world, to our likes and dislikes, and to building up attachment to things of the world, knowingly or unknowingly, we do this all the time. So our meditation practice is helping us to see through that, the old habits of the mind, bring up the mindfulness, investigate the Dhamma to develop <clears throat> more clarity and understanding, and that takes effort, persistent effort was our mental defilements that you know hold us back, cause us suffering, are so deeply ingrained. We need to keep challenging them, keep recognizing them, becoming aware of them, seeing them. And that's why it's good to come and practice for a whole night together, practice meditation together, because you're really putting effort in in a very determined way. It takes effort to practice sitting, walking meditation for hours through the night to go against your desire to sleep, desire to just socialize, eat, drink, talk to your friends and so on. You know, the effort to bring mindfulness up away from all that, bring your mind away from it, is, it requires constant, persistent effort. And that's what will bring our mind towards, closer towards the awakened knowledge that the Buddha was encouraging us to, to develop. As we put effort into the practice, we get interested in it. It becomes interesting, something that we want to do, we're interested in, it's not so boring anymore because you're doing it, benefiting from it. And with interest, we get joy, we get happiness and, and pleasure from the practice. You can only experience the, the joy of pity, rapture, by doing the practice. You know, it's not something you can buy or just wish for. It has to come through that effort, that persistent effort say, to develop your meditation object, mindfulness on the breath, or walking meditation, or recollecting the Buddha. When we put persistent effort into that, the mind becomes joyful, happier, interested, not bored, not dull. So pity is a factor of enlightenment that uplifts the mind, buoys the mind, and sets, it's a cause, a condition for tranquility, pasadi, to arise in the mind and the body start to relax. We don't feel so stressed, we don't feel so, get so caught up in the pain of the body and the discomforts. The mind is more relaxed and happy within itself. And this is another factor of enlightenment. We've got to feel good in ourselves as we practice and that comes through the practice. It's not just we're taking a drug or a drink or seeking some external distraction. It's coming through actually developing the right causes and conditions within our own heart, which is what we're doing in meditation. And pasadi is a cause for samadhi to arise. Those states of calm, firmness of mind, stillness of mind, where the mind's energy gathers together, mind and body gather together, still, calm, peaceful, one-pointed, undistracted, unwavering. Why is this an enlightenment factor? Well, because it sets the right condition for wisdom and insight to arise. The final insight that gives rise to the final factor of enlightenment, which is upeka, that equanimity within all conditions. Because the mind is calm, it can start investigating on the highest level, or the coarsest level or the highest level, that all conditions are impermanent, suffering, not self, not to be clung to, not to be identified with a self. This body is not a self, the mind is not a self, the world around us is not a self, doesn't belong to a self. It's that final insight, having cultivated these seven factors of 
enlightenment over and over again that leads to upeka and the mind is changing from the worldly mind that's always following its wishes and getting disappointed and dis when it doesn't get what it wants and so on to the point where it's seen through the, the deluding nature of the world and worldly conditions, understanding conditions, what, what they are, how they are, wholesome, unwholesome, how they arise, how they pass away, and developing this quality of upeka based on wisdom, clear seeing, knowledge and seeing of the way things are. This is what the Buddha developed in just one night, it would seem, but really it's for, for, uh, for many, many lifetimes of practice. And for us, <coughs> we're developing these seven, same seven factors of enlightenment through our, through our practice. What's the benefit of this? Well, the benefit of this frees the mind from the causes of suffering. You know, suffering has its causes and it has its end. And our practice is to end it and bring up the causes that will end suffering. And we can't do it through willpower alone or wanting alone. It has to also come through learning educating the mind in mindfulness, wisdom, the effort that's needed, the pity, the pity, the joy that arises, the tranquility of body and mind that arises, the samadhi, and then ultimately the, the wisdom that leads to upeka, equanimity towards all conditions. This is what we're practicing and gaining skill in through the practice. Um, so it's a night of practice. You know, Waisak, Wisaka Puja, it's a night to practice, to celebrate and remember the Buddha through the practice, just as he sacrificed for the good of us and others like us. And we can put our efforts in to our practice tonight, both to remember the Buddha and also to, out of gratitude and uh, appreciation of the Buddha, giving something back through our own practice. And this is ultimately what the world needs. You know, the Buddha said, you know, there is Mara in the world, you know, the darkness of ignorance and not understanding things, the darkness of attachment, mental kilesas. The Buddha destroyed that, destroyed all the darkness of craving attachment, the, the normal suffering of human, a human mind. He destroyed that. He ended Mara's uh, hold over him. And Mara and his retinue, his armies, his daughters, you know, that we love to personify in pictures and stories. You know, that's the Buddha overcame Mara um, to be complete, to experience the mind of complete freedom, complete purity. It's interesting that they, you know, the, the Buddha overcame Mara and often Mara is, is seen as an internal thing. You know, the defilements, mental defilements are called Kilesa Mara, the, the, uh, the the obstacles, the the things that block us from achieving doing good and achieving success in the practice of Mara, and they're often seen as internal qualities of mind. But we have to remember, after the Buddha was enlightened and became a Buddha, Mara was still there, trying to impede the Buddha, stop him from teaching, stop him from spreading the, the teachings to help people. But the Buddha himself is no more in light, is no more caught up in Kilesa because he's free, he's reached Nibbana, enlightenment. So Mara, what's left must be the, the what we call Deva Buddha Mara, the Mara the being, because there's no more Kilesa in the mind of the Buddha. So the Mara the being is still hanging around after the Buddha's enlightenment to, to thwart him, stop him. But from then on, the Buddha could quite, with great confidence, always say, I know you, Mara because Ma, he has no more kilesas in his mind. The end of the Buddha's life, uh, as we know, his final teaching to everyone was because causes and conditions are impermanent, all formations, physical, mental, are impermanent, we should continue to practice with heedfulness. Uh, and that's all in itself is a great reflection you know, why are we practicing? Well, because the world is an impermanent, uncertain place. Our life is uncertain. Our state of mind is uncertain. The external world around us is uncertain. You know, the economy, the society, how people are, our relationships is all very uncertain, changing. Uh, because of that, the Buddha said, practice with heedfulness, because you never know how things are going to change. Tonight, today, 
how things will be changing, unfolding for ourselves, for the other people, for the world. You know, all kinds of suffering comes and goes, doesn't it? You know, since the time of the Buddha, you know, how many pandemics has the world seen come and go? This is uh, Sabe, Sankara, Anicca, all formations are impermanent, not sure. You know, there's a pandemic and then gradually it fades into the background as people become immune to it or we treat them or we discover <coughs> antidotes and so on. How many wars have come and gone since the time of the Buddha? Wars between individual groups of people, countries, whole world wars. They come and go. You know, how many cities have been built and created and then disappeared and faded into, into nothing? All kinds of different ex major experiences have been come, uh, arising and passing away over and over again, whether in the minds of individuals or groups of people, whole nations, and so on. You know, the world is a constant changing place. It's because of that, the Buddha said, practice with heedfulness. Be careful, be heedful, reflect on what you're doing, bring up mindfulness so you're prepared for whatever comes next. And you know that warning is not to bring out anxiety or scare you, but it's more to prepare you, uh, like a parent prepares their kids when they go to school. You know, go to school, but you know, listen to the teacher, do what you have to do. That kind of instruction to be on guard, to be careful, to pay attention. That's what the Buddha was encouraging us to do, because ultimately our biggest danger is our own mind that is not heedful, careless not mindful of the teachings, not mindful of karma, not mindful of the present moment. We're constantly creating suffering for ourselves and others. So tonight is a night to celebrate and remember, well, we have this way out of suffering. The Buddha gave it to us. Now it's up to us to practice it. So uh, for now, I'll end the talk here and wish you all well in your practice and may you all benefit from your practice today and in the future may it, practicing following the buddha's teaching be a cause for your enlightenment may it be a cause for your growth in the seven factors of enlightenment may you come to realize the dhamma and free yourselves from suffering <laughs>